Well, I've got a word for you this morning, and I, I believe it's, it's a very good and very strong word. And I want you today to lean in. I'm kind of almost thankful that we get to do this because you can be undistracted and unhindered just listening to the word. And I believe it's an important one. I want you to almost lean in to the screen a little bit or put, put the, the phone close to your ear so you really don't miss anything. Um, I, this is part of the sermon series that I've been in right now uh, that's called New Life because we, I sense the Lord is just bringing us into a season of new life, a new growth. Something is coming up, something is growing, some, and everybody seems to confirm that right now that the Lord is growing something inside of us. He's kindling the fire inside of us, and He's just really growing something, He's bringing something out. I talked about, uh, for, the first one was about making room, I preached about Noah. It's like the Lord, it seems like He made room room for the new thing. Sometimes it needs to wipe out the old stuff, like taking out the trash. It needs to wipe out the old stuff. Then leaving Egypt, you know, we talked about the Exodus and what it means to leave Egypt behind. And then we talked about uh, raising Samson. <laughs> Last week, I don't know if you were distracted in the car with the kids. It was kind of hard to pay attention. But raising Samson, there's something about what we trust the Lord and what he wants to do. And he raises up uh, leaders for in, in, in times like these. Amen. Now today, the Lord drew my attention. I knew the story of Nehemiah. I, I, some had the story of Nehemiah of the rebuilding, uh, the, the, that whole second temple period. It's called the second temple period. was the, the rebuilding because it was building the, second, the temple the second time around. Um, and so as soon as I went there, the Lord drew my attention to the rebuilding instead of uh, the wall, Nehemiah, but the story of rebuilding the center of it first that is the temple of the lord so actually when you think about it when god starts rebuilding something it doesn't start with a fence right when we start building a house do you start with a fence no right you start building the house i knew a guy who was very fond of a extremely valuable stove he wanted to to do like a, a tile stove that would warm the whole house he didn't just build the house he built the stove when he started building a house he started to build the stove in the middle of an empty yard uh, on, on the, on the uh, concrete, on the surface, on the foundation. And he started to build the stove. And then he started to build the rooms around it accordingly so that the heat would go into all the rooms. We have to start building at the center. And I feel like when, what the Lord is doing right now too, he starts building us at the center with the things that are most valuable to him. We can do anything we want to do without ever paying attention to the Lord. But it's not the work that God has called us to do. We have to start with paying attention to God, learning to hear His voice again. You know, there's something about where I feel like sometimes we are so busy with our whitewashed noise all around us that we kind of forget how the voice of the Lord sounds like. Like sheep. Uh, with a shepherd, we can sometimes forget what the shepherd smells like. What, uh, and I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about the Lord. He's our shepherd. He's a chief shepherd. Amen? He smells better than I do. But how, how he smells like, what his voice is like, uh, how he feels like. And uh, sometimes we forget it because we get so distracted. We get so busy. Uh, and so we, the Lord is allowing us. He's like, he, he has to bring us to himself in order so that we can learn. And again, that's what the Lord is doing right now. He wants to reconcile construct something. He wants to rebuild our life. He wants to bring new life, and all of this is playing into it. Today, I want to talk about rebuilding the temple, about rebuilding uh, that second temple period. About the, the, the sermon is called Rebuilding the Temple, and it's very interesting, just the timing, where we're slowly kind of opening up church again, and we're coming back to building, and the Lord has been building us, and the Lord is building something new in us and through us, so He's doing something, and right now, that message, um, and I, I just, this morning, I, I was just floundered by it, I think the Lord is awesome with His timing. But let's get into the word. This is, so um, since we're not about Nehemiah talking about the wall, it's about building the center, building the temple, the whole story. And you uh, just bear with me. There is a lot in there. It's, it's in Ezra chapter 1. It, it literally starts where the Lord just uh, urges Israel, go back and start building the temple. And he, st he starts that by speaking to um, 
the, not the emperor, but uh, the leader of the dynasty of the Persian Empire, and that is Cyrus, um, King Cyrus. And this is in Ezra 1, verse 1. It says, In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the, uh, the word, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia. Amen. The Lord stirred up uh, the heart of the king. It's interesting because this whole time period of Israel coming back, I mean, just imagine that they have, they went, they came from Egypt. They went through the desert wandering. God sent them back because they were so fearful that they rejected the promised land. So God said, okay, if you don't want it, there's going to be a turnover of a whole new generation. Maybe the next generation pays more attention to me or trusts me better. So he, with the next generation, he brings them into the promised land. That doesn't mean that all of a sudden it's empty. It means that they have to battle the way in but the lord is always faithful wherever they went they brought the presence of the lord now remember the sermon series the lord had to teach them the presence first and now they learned the lesson now they're carrying the presence of the lord wherever they walk and wherever they walk wherever they set foot whatever city they, they had to battle the presence of the lord did the battle for them literally did the, just think about jericho just blowing those trumpets without anybody ever raising a sword i mean it's incredible if we learn if we're going to the through the school the disciples school of the lord and he's teaching us his presence and we learn this lesson well guess what wherever we set our foot the presence of the lord comes amen amen and that that's good news because the lord wants to proceed he wants to move forward so they have lear learned the lesson, and then through multiple unfaithfulness, they have been idle because they failed to drive out here, and they failed to drive out there, and they settled for a compromise here and there. And then all the ambitions of what God has, if we are slack and if we compromise, the evil grows again. If we don't uproot evil entirely to 100%, it will continue to grow again, and it's, it's just coming back. It's like trimming back weeds just a little bit. <laughs> they just come back, right? And that's just how it is. And so the, after all of this time period of unfaithfulness in thousand years, um, then the Lord sent them into exile. He brought them back and said, now is the time. The 70 years are fulfilled. I want to bring you back. And so he starts by stirring the heart of the king. Now, in order to understand that there's a, a, a change of kings as well, under Nebuchadnezzar was the, the king of Babylon, Israel was ex exported into Babylon. All right, now Nebuchadnezzar is, is dead. Um, 70 years later, the Persian Empire took over the Babylonian Empire. Now we talk about the Persian Empire. It's not the same anymore that took them into captivity. But in the Persian Empire, you, you, the talk is about three different kings. The first one was King Cyrus, who gave them the order to go back then all of a sudden, we, we're going to start talking about King Artaxerxes. Uh, he, he's a, he was a king in between. And then you have uh, Darius, and Darius kind of gave them the go-get. Under, under Xer Artaxerxes, he ruled that Israel has to stop building the temple. So under Cyrus, he said, go back and start rebuilding the house of the Lord, the house of your God. Artaxerxes said, stop. Stop building. Did you ever have a construction site and somebody said, stop building? The whole thing, just stop building. And then a third one comes along, and that's Darius, and he says, you can go ahead again. So that's kind of important to keep in mind. But here, in the story, so Israel is coming back. They're excited. They're, it's like coming back to church, right? They're, they're, they're coming back into the country again. They get to rebuild something. They, they, gotta, they, they, have, they can, they're allowed back in. It's a, a small handful of people actually that returns from all the people that were de deported. Uh, actually, only like 40 or 50,000 roughly came back. And so, but this small group of people was very committed. Their heart was in the right place. They were extremely careful to do the right thing and to please the Lord. And so they started to rebuild the temple. Uh, but uh, along the lines, they kind of got slacked and, uh, as well and stopped rebuilding the temple. But that was because of an order. Here, let's get into the story. Chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Now when the um, adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the a returned exiles were building the temple to the Lord, the God of Israel. 
they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's houses and said to them, Let us build with you, for we worship your God as you do. And we have been sacrificing to him ever since the days of, I cannot pronounce that name, Eshradon, a king of Assyria, who brought us here. So the Assyrian Empire, when they conquered northern Israel, they had a different philosophy than the Babylonians. They replaced the people. So those are not Jews. They were replaced and bringing in their own religion, but also accepting the local God, which is the God, of, uh, of, of, uh, the God that we worship. And so these people come alongside the Jews and they're saying to him, we worship the same God. I just think it's so interesting. When the Lord wants to do something, the enemy, the Satan, the opposer, the accuser of our life and the accuser of the saints, he will always bring alongside something with good intentions. But the finished product will never look like what God had intended. It's somewhere along the way, and it's so hard to detect. It's so hard to see. Sometimes we're just being deceived by something uh, small. Maybe it's just like just going online, just watching something that you're not supposed to. Or I don't know, it's, um, you make the math. There's a plethora of examples that, that you can do. It's just tolerating something next to you or uh, just allowing something and just thinking, you know, it doesn't hurt. Why not? You know, it, it, it's probably not harmful at all. But the finished product would never be the same. And so the Jews kind of, they smelled the coffee here and they said, no, thank you. Uh, we don't want to do that. Uh, this is our house and, and uh, we are taking charge here and we do the job ourselves. This is what they say in verse 3. You have nothing to do with us in building the house to our God. Remember, the house of the Lord is a house of prayer. It is of devotion. If somebody worships something else, humanity or something else, uh, it's, it's, it's not the same end goal. But we alone will build the house to the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded. And then, listen to this, then the people of the land discouraged the people of, G of Judah and made them afraid to build and bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. Did you ever, as a child, play in a sandbox? You played in a sandbox and you build a little sandcastle and another kid comes along and says, oh, this looks fun, can I play with you? And you just know that you know that you know that this other kid has a different agenda than what you have because you want to build this castle in a certain form and you have this picture in your mind about the ideal, about how this thing is going to look like and you say to the other kid, no, this is what I do, right? Uh, this is my building project. What happens with that other kid? That other kid is not going to, okay, I just built my own stuff. Sometimes they do, but sometimes they get angry at you. And they start mocking you. And they start telling you, eh, eh, you know, it's never going to turn out into anything. You know, it's not going to happen. And uh, look, you're doing it all wrong. I could have done it better. And starting discouraging somebody. <laughs> Isn't that exactly the voice of the enemy? It's like when the Lord is trying to build something in our heart, and in our soul, and we're kind of starting the process, and we kind of have this picture about what God wants to do, and we, and we, we smell the coffee. We know that the evil one wants to steal from us. He wants to kill our spirit. He wants to destroy. And so we say, no, we resist him, and then we expect him to flee from us, right? And he does. But then he always comes back, right? He always comes back like this roaring lion that goes around, just a roaring lion. We, we know that from First Peter. He, he, he's there, constantly watching out, but he's accusing us. He's constantly accusing us and trying to discourage us and that's what he's doing he's discouraging and making you afraid he's, he loves those two shovels those two tools for the sandbox he loves them discouragement and fear discouragement and fear do not buy into those anything that smells like discouragement or fear don't go for it um, and he bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days, listen to this, all the days of Cyrus, the king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, which was the third king, then there was Artaxerxes in between, Darius, king of Persia. And in the reign of, this is Artaxerxes now, he just has a, the Jewish name here, Ashurerus. Uh, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. 
So they wrote a letter of complaint. Not only did the, did the frustration and the if, trying to instill fear in them work, so they had to, like, okay, they were sanctioned, they were given the power from the king himself who is in Persia. So they drafted up an evil letter to accuse them, to speak evil against them. Do you have a written assignment that you sometimes feel like, I think the accuser of a life, the accuser of a soul, he has drafted up a concrete plan of accusations against me, and he has sent that to the king. And you kind of feel that, that stirring, and it's like, this is, this is out, this is on the way. That's kind of what happened here. So it reaches, it reaches them. So when God is trying to create new life, opposition comes in and this opposition that's exactly what is taking place here um, and then it says in the days of Artaxerxes uh, Bishlam and Mithridat and Tabil and the rest of the associates wrote to Artaxerxes the king of Persia and he uh, kind of blaming them that it's a really bad the inhabitants again and all of this is is just going to turn sour again if you're not careful oh Artaxerxes and now what Artaxerxes is responding is he's telling them to stop building. So this is the second king. Now he's telling them, okay, that you should not continue to build. Listen to this. This is now in verse 17 and onward, still in, in chapter 4. Um, it start, starts in verse 17, and the king sent uh, an answer. And so he addresses the leaders. And verse 20, then it says, and mighty... So he, he basically tells him... Um, Verse 19, and I made a degree, and a search has been made. So they made an investigation. A search has been made, and it has been found that this city, uh, talking about Jerusalem, uh, from old has, has, raised, has risen against kings, uh, emperors, has risen against kings, and that rebellion and sedition have, come, have been made in it. Verse 20, and mighty kings, he's talking about Solomon and David, and mighty kings have been over Jerusalem who ruled over the whole province beyond the river to whom tribute, I mean, under King Solomon, it was just enjoyed such a wealthy period of time. Uh, kings came from near and far and paid tribute, and uh, there was a lot of negotiation contracts made that were at the peak of its wealth, uh, uh, tribute, and customs, and toll were paid. Verse 21, therefore, make the degree, and don't be mistaken, any king whom, of Persia who makes a degree cannot reverse what he has degreed. He literally has to die for that de degree to be over. And that's what happened in our story here. Therefore, make a degree that these men be made to seize and that this city be not rebuilt until the degree is made by me, which he never would. In verse 22, and, the, and, the, and take care not to be slack in this matter. Why should damage grow to the hurt of the king? So he's basically doing like this, this self-talk in the letters, like you got to stop doing this. Because if you do this, it's going to be bad for our economy. It's going to be bad for a relationship because nothing good has come out of this in the past. And it's going to hurt my rule. So that's what Artaxerxes literally does, being stirred by, by false people accusing, accusing the Jews, accusing the people of God from doing the right thing that God called them to do. And so the king made a degree that they have to stop with everything. And now, all of a sudden, it doesn't take long where we read all of a sudden that the rebuilding begins anew. And that's the third one. The rebuilding begins anew. And that's right in chapter 5. And it says, now the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Edo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem and in the name of God of Israel who was over them. Just, we don't know what they said, right? So it, it doesn't say anything here in the story. And then uh, verse 2, it says, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and Jeshua, the son of Zodadak, arose and began to rebuild the house of God that is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. All of a sudden, they started building again. Man, I thought to myself, 
What in the world did Haggai and Zechariah say to them? That must have been some powerful words. Don't you think? I mean, there's a king, there's a letter from the king who is in charge of the world's army, right? He can just crush any riot, anything. that, And, and so the locals, they're stopping to work. And all of a sudden, we hear about two dudes, literally, that speak up for God and says, this is what the Lord says. And all of a sudden, not even in the fear and in the face of death or persecution or anything, they start rebuilding the house of God that God had called them to do. And I was like, I would like to know what those two guys said, wouldn't you? I mean, that would be really interesting to know. Well, we know exactly what those two guys said. Those are the two prophets. And for that, I want to encourage you, turn to Haggai. Do you remember that Haggai chapter 1? Just in the first chapter here, remember I, when I posted something online, just uh, maybe it was a week ago, I felt very strong that there is a prophetic spirit coming. That the Lord, in the time period in which we are right now, it feels like that the Lord wants to speak again. He wants to speak when, when things in the world do not look good and people are driving their own agenda. The Lord starts speaking more clear than ever before. He starts speaking. He's starting to give direction. And there is, and I, I felt this this um, last two weeks, that there is a, a prophetic spirit rising again in the churches of God where the Lord speaks more clearly than ever before. And he urges the church to stay on track with what God has given us to do, the task that God Go in all the world, make disciples, right? Baptize them, lead them to the Lord, baptize them, baptism of repentance, and teach them, instruct them in the ways of the Lord um, so that everybody reaches that maturity in the Lord. We have a task. And here's, okay, here's what, what the two prophets said. And this is Haggai, chapter 1, verse 1. In the second year of Darius the king, so this is, this is under Darius. This is the third king now again, after Artaxerxes has passed away. And now Darius, the new king, he can make a new order, right? And so now in the second year of Darius the king, the, the Lord literally opened up the, the, the mouth of the prophet and started prophesying to Israel. Verse 2, it says, These people say that the a time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. So the prophet says, um, everybody's saying, oh, the time is not yet. It's not yet time to rebuild the house of the Lord. You know, one of the tactics, if the enemy cannot stop you from what you're doing, he will try to give you bad advice <laughs> to do it later, to push it off. You know what? You can do it tomorrow. You know, you don't have to send that text message to apologize or to repent to so-and-so. Do it tomorrow. <laughs> it always works. It's pretty bad. It always works. Um, uh, he says, These people say that the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. And then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. It is a time for you. Is, is it a time for you yourself to dwell in your planned, paneled houses, like beautiful houses, while the house, while this house, the house of God, lies in ruin in verse 5 then he, he just says now therefore thus says the lord of hosts consider your ways you have sown much and you harvested little you eat but you never have enough you drink but you never have your fill you clothe yourself but no one is warm <laughs> wow and he who earns wages does so to put them into bags with holes did you ever wonder if you have a bank account that has holes, that somehow <laughs> everything that you put in is draining away somewhere else and it just doesn't stay in the bank account? And this is how Israel must have felt during this time. It's like, what is going on? It's like you, you, you start focusing on yourself. And this is the principle. If you focus on yourself, it will run away faster from you than what you can catch it or what you can earn or what you can come up with. If you only focus on yourself, and this is what the prophet says, the number one message here from Haggai is don't look to yourself. Put God first. He says, is it a time for yourself to build your own house while this house, the house of the Lord, lies in ruin? In verse 7, then it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Um, go up to the hills and bring wood and build build the house. 
that I may take pleasure in it and that you, I may feel, sorry, uh, that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? Declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. If we focus on ourselves, if we only ever live to ourselves for self sufficiency, for working, if we concentrate on ourselves, if the concentration, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and strength, wholly, holistically focus on the Lord. But if we focus on ourselves, what we want to do, uh, we, what we can accomplish, it all is going to run away as fast as you can only look. And the Lord says, if you put me first, that's going to work. It's like, if you put my house first, if you, I will never forget the words of a pastor uh, who said, if you take care of the, the, the flock of God, God will always take care of you. It's the same principle. If you, if you do the will of the Lord that God has called you to do, and if you neglect the other things, your own wishes and things for a while, and you focus Focus first on the kingdom of God. Everything else will be added to you. And you will see how the Lord changes it. And this is the message that God spoke through Haggai to the nation during this time. We saw that they started rebuilding again, but we didn't know why. Here, the first message was stop focusing on yourself. Stop being self-consumed and self-observed. Put God first. And that's as simple as that. Put God first. Now, the second thing that was spoken, was spoken through Zechariah. And Zechariah just uh, turned, is, uh, Zechariah is right the next prophet. Just flip the page. Uh, Zechariah chapter 1, um, in the eighth month, in the second year of Darius. So just a, a couple months later, uh, God gave another prophetic utterance. He gave another prophetic speech through the prophet Zechariah, uh, and he spoke through him. And for that, turn to chapter 4. That's really where we have the whole thing. In Zechariah chapter 4, here is a second word. So the first word that God spoke to Israel was to stop focusing on yourself, focus on me. Put God first. Now the second thing is, he talks first about the, the, the vision, uh, like a heavenly vision about the lampstands of gold. Uh, actually, if you want to have a solid interpretation for the letter of Revelation, here is a very good place to start. You have the lampstands, you have two olive trees that stand by it. But then, uh, let's stay on track here. And in verse 6, it says, Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, right? The guy in charge of the rebuilding, reconstruction process. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? He's prophesying to the king of Persia, the king who ruled the world, the ancient world at this time. He's saying to them, who are you, O, o great mountain, like this with all your riches, with all your wealth, with all your chariots and horses and fighting mans and spears and everything that you've got. You've got the strongest army in the world. But he just laid it out, not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord of hosts. And now he says, and you, O great mountain, with all your riches, um, who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel, you have become a plain. Zerubbabel was nothing. He had like 30, 40,000 guys, a uh, very weak army, but it was by the Spirit of the Lord. That is where the might is, and that is where the power is. And when, when I read this, I felt like, man, you know what? You could have a church with the strongest programs, with the strongest of everything. You can do the strongest outreaches. You can dump millions of dollars into everything that you are doing and just getting yourself busy and busy and busy and busy working. It all looks great on a piece of paper. But what is that the Lord is calling a church to do? What is the thing that the Lord is calling each one of We are the church, right? What is the thing that the Lord is calling us to do when he says, it is not by might, it is not by power, it is by 
my spirit, says the Lord. All the power, all the, everything that God wants to unlock, the heavenly is only unlocked through the spirit of God. And if we don't have the spirit of God, all we do is busy work. But if the spirit of God, if we do everything in the spirit of God, that's what God is stirring in us right now. He's stirring our spirit. He's fanning it into flame. Whatever is done through the spirit of God unleashes the power of heaven. Amen? Somebody shout amen right now. <laughs> that was a powerful sentence. Yeah, it, when we are walking in the spirit of God, the Lord unleashes His power of heaven by my spirit. And then He continues and says one more thing here. Um, let me go to verse 9 here. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also complete it. And then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. I'm talking about Zechariah. To verse 10. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plump line in the hand of Zerubbabel. Hmm, what is it talking about? Small beginnings. It's because when the Holy Spirit does something, He starts small. There is small beginnings that we always despise. It talks about despising the small things, the day of small beginnings. King James Version says it, the days of small beginnings. If we despise the small things that the Lord is doing, we will never see the great things that God is about to do. Because it is in the small things, in the Spirit of God that He starts. And here's a formula for you. Do you like math? I'm pretty bad with math, but I am good with spiritual math. And here is the spiritual math that God has for new life and for rebuilding. If, if there is a rebuilding going on in your life, if the Lord wants to rebuild your life, listen very carefully to this. The formula is very simple. It is small beginnings multiplied by the Spirit of God. It is small beginnings multiplied by the Spirit of God. That's how God is rebuilding our life. It's not even... The one plus the other, whenever the Holy Spirit is added to anything, it starts multiplying. But it, it's, it starts with the small beginnings. If the Lord has urged you to do something, if the Lord has, uh, you guys can come on. If the Lord has urged you to do something, if the Lord has urged you to restructure, maybe small beginnings is like restructuring prayer life. Maybe a small beginning is like starting tithing. Maybe small beginnings is writing a letter of apology to so-and-so. Small beginnings can be anything, but you have been pushing it off. Maybe the enemy has been discouraging you. Maybe he sent a letter of accusation toward you, and you just sit there like a locked-up prisoner. But the Lord wants to unleash it again. He wants to rebuild. He wants to continue the rebuilding process in our life. And all it is is commitment to the small beginnings where God wants to start and we need His Spirit because those small beginnings multiply, multiplied by the Spirit of God is that it will be the product that God calls us to do. Amen? Amen. I want you to hear that this is, this is um, in this series about new life, time to rebuild. I believe that for our church and for our personal life, the talks are about coming back to church already and um, very soon churches are, are open again. The Lord is rebuilding. It's time to rebuild. But I urge you, do not show up to church exactly the same way you were before. God has been doing stuff in the meantime. And if you have not been part of that yet, and it's not our church program. It's God's program with your heart. It's God's program with your mind and with your commitment, with your self-discipline, with your devotion toward Him, with your paying attention to Him. The Lord is in this reconstruction business. And he, 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 the message from failing to continuing in the plans of the Lord in the rebuilding program is very simple. It was those two points. Put God first, and then a very, put God first in a very simple fo formula. It starts with small beginnings multiplied by the Spirit of God. If you keep those things in mind, you will be on the train where God wants to lead you to and on a very sure and safe path. Amen. Amen.